I wanted to tonight talk about the role of the museum as placemaker and related to this, the special relationship possible between, normally between art and architecture. So to do that, I'm going to refer to some of our museum projects, which are in various stages of development, some finished and some in design and some about to be in construction. And it's interesting that Jane is here tonight from JHC because a, uh, one of the key uh, thinkings around the idea of the museum as placemaker came from or got crystallised in my mind through an article which Jane gave me uh, about from Elaine Human gurian who writes a lot about museums and calls them the new town square. So this idea that museums are a place of community and gathering, a place where connections are forged, skills acquired, a love of art nurtured, history and culture celebrated. So it's about uh, obviously the more traditional role of the museum, um, whether it's a gallery or a museum of other type of content, but it also exceeds that with more wide ranging initiatives, including research, education, things like artists in residence programs, and then of course some commercial programs such as retail and food and so forth that complements that. So, we know some of those programming things, but what I wanted to talk through tonight through the projects was just how architecture helps to reinforce place as well. So apart from what we put into and the activities that are there, uh, what are the spatial means by which we enable that to happen? We've designed um, a few now, and each of these have, has attempted to use architecture and landscape as a blueprint for forming uh, place that's not only just about congregation and contribution, but somehow brings what's in the museum and the strict walls of the museum out into the more public domain. So how we weave the museum into the life of the community so that it becomes incidental to one's everyday experience and enjoyment of place. So these are hopefully going to explain a little bit more of that. So to start, um, the first project, which was really our first experience with a gallery or museum, was Monash University's Museum of Art. And the thing I think that this project is really important for is also what it's done for the campus. So we see this as a project that, even though the official brief was a new museum uh, moving the Clayton from Clayton to Caulfield campus, we also saw it as a chance to really transform the campus and start to repair it. So we talk a lot about how good architecture and landscape can be a way in which you can improve or enhance or regenerate a place. So this was certainly an opportunity. Now this is what we started with. Uh, so on the Danny Nong Road, as you might all know that road, and this was what we had to begin with. We were working with this curved building here, the ground floor of that, and the competition we won was to do a new museum inside that. There was no talk of what might happen here. This was dumpsters, cars, it's not particularly great. So we did think if you're going to do a museum, you've got to do something with the space around it as well. And further to that, that idea of expanding the possibility of the project was also uh, this work by uh, Callum Morton, Silver Screen, mm. which was a really great way to address part of our original brief. Um, the competition brief that time was to do something on the roadside, on Danny Nong Road, to make it clear to people that the museum was there, to give it some sort of identity. And after us kind of tinkering and thinking, well, we haven't really got the money to do much, what do you do, a sort of few coloured tiles or something on the wall? It's not really going to do it. And so this is where we thought, why don't we let art speak about the museum rather than architecture? So the commissioning of Callum was a really critical part of the project's success, which you can see here and which has a lovely link to the, um, the old drive-in cinema um, further down the highway. So it has a nice historic link. And of course, Callum has an ongoing interest in that um, type of uh, armature structure as cultural frame. Some very early sketches, uh, the one on, I always get confused with my left and rights when I'm standing looking at these <laughs> on, on over that side, was just this idea of introducing or um, a sort of restorative landscape around the museum. And then this one here is, may, may not make an enormous amount of sense to you, but we had a curved building to start with. 
And really, we had a curator who wanted a square or a straight building. So the big question for us was, what do you do when you have a very strong geometry to start with and you have a curator who effectively wants a very neutral white space? So more <coughs> on that in a minute. So one of the things that this little diagram here is describing, it's a plan of the building going out to the landscape, is how we relate what's happening inside the museum to out into the landscape. It's a way of dragging the galleries out into the centre of the campus through a series of um, you know, looser space for outdoor uh, furniture in the sculpture forecourt, but also how we use the geometry of the original building to set up our new spaces inside. These very long vistas through the radial lines and then the parallel lines setting up the main circulation. So there's a plan for the architects in the audience. So here are those sort of curved, um, curved lines, which I think were sort of, they were slightly anxious about. So we've managed to still get relatively simple, uh, rec more rectilinear spaces, but lots of corners as well in the gallery, which was important. And then there's a great debate about whether uh, museums for art should be white and neutral or whether they should be more expressive. Um, is it the architecture we're there to see or is it the art or can you do both? You know, we all, we've all heard those debates. And in this one, what we decided was funny, um, Max Delaney, who's the curator at the time or director, he gave me an article by an artist, a Swiss artist called Remy Zorg, who works a lot with Herzog de Maron. And this essay was an artist's explanation of what the perfect gallery space would be. And it was all about white walls, white floor, this and that, and nothing to interrupt. And Max said to me, oh, look, you'll find this entertaining. I don't really think this is what we should do, but it's just a bit of background. Well, as the project went on, I realised that there was quite a lot of lessons in that that I think they were hoping would be applied. So how we resolved it was we decided to keep the central um, corridor, which had all those sort of curving columns and so on, which I think they felt might disrupt the art. We left that as a much more expressive space. It's where you see the original bones of the building and it's more coloured. You can see the builders servicing and um, it's almost like the back walls of the perfect white space on the other side, which is the galleries. So it was... And this has turned into not just circulation, but also like a looser type of um, project space <coughs> as well. Then here is in one of the back galleries with one of those big vistas through to the courtyard, which is at the end of that light. And then that very gentle curve that's the reminder of Dandenong Road being on the other side there. Uh, there's another view of that um, pristine gallery and that more expressive circulation space. So also about revealing, you know, the workings behind the scenes of making gallery space work. So importantly, in terms of that idea of campus repair, what we also did with these very large windows into the museum from the forecourt, it means that even people who uh, never want to actually go inside the museum are somehow reminded or presented by the contents of it. So someone rushing to a lecture on another part of the campus uh, just gets a glimpse inside. And we think that's a really lovely way that it just infiltrates your everyday experience. And similarly in the forecourt now, that's grown up a bit, these um, lovely sculptures, which change all the time, by the way, and then these platforms for people to just hang out. So that's an example of how um, the, the museum has been able to help regenerate the centre of the campus. So next project is the Jewish Holocaust Centre. And uh, this is, um, it's, so here we have the earlier heritage building. This has a heritage listing on it. And then the project SJB's uh, edition from, was this late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, here. So the, this is a project which is about Sounds dramatic. <laughs> uh, about increasing, really increasing opportunities for uh, slightly expanded museum offerings, education and research, which are the three main um, purposes of, of the centre. And also, interestingly, what's happened um, in the time that we've been working on this project is that there's been quite a lot of development in the area and the council is interested in rethinking how Selwyn Street is designed. 
so that there is a kind of precinct um, with the role, with the museum playing a central role within that, uh, within this area. So one of the things we've been interested in is how the museum can, uh, if you like, contribute to that uh, precinct and have a sort of more lively street presence but also resolve that tension between it being a Holocaust museum, which is a building that, the type of building that has high security issues around it, how it resolves that and still has a kind of generosity and a sense of the life inside it from the street. So that's been a key thing we've been exploring. And, you know, having looked at a lot of overseas examples, um, typically Holocaust museums have adopted and a type of architecture that tends to be quite close, certainly to outside. So it's been quite a challenge, but I think, excuse me, a worthwhile one to work through. So some of the key ideas, this little diagram on the left is just the thinking about how we might arrange the activities within the inside of the building uh, in ways so that the, the more um, front of house things and some of the activities like research and admin, you might actually, less climate sensitive, you might actually see from the street so that there's a sense of activities and liveliness inside. And the other thing in particular is that even research, the research that happens, that's on the little yellow bit right on the corner, is something you can look into from the street. Again, that um, it's not all hidden. One of the changes we're seeing in lots of museums is that stuff that's normally back of house is starting to become more front of house so that the hidden assets of a museum are more evident to people passing by and so on. The other part of this is that there's the, um, this heritage building, which was in the end, it was uh, required to be kept. And so how, and that was partly for planning and heritage reasons in terms of urban planning. But we also saw that um, the way in which we've treated it, it's almost embedded like an artifact, which is, tells something too of the origins of the center um, being the first building that was occupied for the museum. So some early uh, renders where it's a very sort of simple new element that's quite neutral and that holds this um, early, earliest origin of the museum being the heritage building and that you can see has a sense of um, transparency as you move up so you see a little bit more of what's inside. And then some visualisations which were starting to work with this idea of Selwyn Street becoming more of a pedestrian street, at least in part, uh, to help also manage just how it works with kids arriving and leaving and bus loads and so on. So these were some early studies and really what I'm showing you is a bit of behind the scenes, the development of the project um, because it's obviously not uh, completed. We're working through design development at the moment. But here too, one of the important things is where you have quite internal spaces, typically in, in a museum, like this education space here. And then this interest in the circulation of the museum always bringing you back to being in Melbourne, reminding you that you're here. Um, very, very difficult content, very confronting, very upsetting. And so the motive of the garden and these snippets to the um, to the world outside we thought was quite an important uh, element in the project. As you can see in these early renders. So um, similarly that we treated this main entry arrival uh, space as a space that can also double for larger events and openings, just having a bit more space than is currently there. And you can see the garden at the end, which will feature Andrew Rogers and um, sculpture from the front and the eternal flame in the back. So these constantly seeing these links back to garden. The research centre, which is on the street and the window, the arch window, which links back to the street. So you always have a sense of your neighbourhood when you're in there. Um, and then the use of that very distinctive turret that's on the original building is what we've used to, as, a light, as a light tube for the memorial space, which also includes the stained glass windows, an important part of the existing building. So that view up to sky is important. So then more recently, um, when we were sort of constantly working through this issue of how to resolve the uh, facade of the building to be both secure and robust, but also 
have a degree of transparency. At one stage, we, want, we were looking at a lot more glass, and of course, I think the costs of bomb proof and you know all of the security was just so prohibitive that was dumped as an idea. So more recently, what we've started to think about is the use of these um, glass bricks that you can get. So you can see that you start with a very solid or um, secure base, and then as you go up, it becomes lighter. The motive of light is important in this project, light as in understanding and part of tolerance and helping people to also understand differently, especially pertinent right now. So you can see here too that at night the centre becomes like a beacon of sorts too. And behind you see the, the gardens um, that are just behind the facade and sense of life. So in that sense it's also celebrating survival as much as what it is memorialising. And some little prototypes. These were the sorts of things that architects get up to in their offices. We got a um, whole stack of these beautiful glass bricks and um, our Danish student did these little models. He just sort of built them up. This is not actually mortar, it's plasterboard that's been cut and painted grey. So, yeah, very um, convincing. But you can see there the sort of light, so you can imagine a garden behind or the sky behind, this uh, lovely relationship between the building and its environment. So some sort of more later views of that central space um, and views back towards that uh, glass and brick facade. So, so that's um, quite, a, quite a change, but so that's in progress and um, it's, we hope to be starting on site middle of the year is the intention, so fingers crossed, we've got a bit to do. The next project is the Shepparton Museum design and sadly this is one of the projects that got away. It does happen and you do get over it but it's, this was one where we, we, there was expression of interest called for architects for the Shepparton Art Museum and we, you had to do a written document and on the basis of that we were one of five officers shortlisted to actually compete and come up with a design. So this was our project and uh, I like to think of it as calling it Go With The Flow. Mm -hmm. Shepparton is a, um, is in a it's, the site was in a flood landscape. It seems just about every project of ours is in a, a, a site prone to flood or fire or both. And this one was definitely one of those flood landscapes. So one of the things that's really interesting to me, and this was a learning that came through a lot of our housing work, is that ecology doesn't have a boundary. You know, this, the site survey we get has a very particular title boundary and here's your lines and that's what you work within. But of course, uh, floods don't work like that. And so we were very interested in thinking how the building and the landscape design might respond or be more resilient to a much more dynamic landscape. So the first image is just describing how the site is part of a much bigger ecological system, being the Goulburn, the Goulburn, Valley, uh, Goulburn Valley River system. Then, of course, it's what the purpose of the building would be in terms of being a regional centre, so to revitalise it. The next point at the next scale down is really what does the building give back to the, um, to the park that it would be sitting within? How could it make a better park? And last of all, how would it work as a museum? So some little early drawings which are really just describing this idea of the building being part of this larger flood landscape and the idea that it would be on these feet um, made up of little buildings on the ground that water could just pass through. So if and when floods happened mm -hmm. and the curved elements was just not obstructing that flow, hence go with the flow. So the, um, the thinking here, some little diagrams about why it's the form it is, is this idea that they, we could have a small amount of footprint on the ground and then what the brief called for was on the left hand side just stacking into a four or five storey building. What we decided to do instead of doing that is to in fact lift it off the ground on these feet and then spread it out to form a canopy. So one mm -hmm. of the things you notice people do when they camp, first thing you do, you put up some kind of canopy for shelter and shade and especially in somewhere like um, Shepparton gets very, very hot. So we saw value in creating, using the amount of building to make shade underneath. 
So then what we did was take that big canopy and then, oh, I've got a pointer here. That's much easier, isn't it? <laughs> um, and then we took three big bites out of it. And each time we took a bite, it was to create a new landscape, a sort of smaller landscape around the edges of the building. So this one was to the north, which was a little sort of amphitheatre and recreation space linked to the cafe of the museum. This one was linking more towards the wetland and a sort of more formal area of the wetland. And then this one was the forecourt of the car park, but we thought the car park could also be integrated into the um, design thinking of the, of the site. And then, so you get these bites, this scalloped edge, and then internally, when we're inside the museum, where you need a lot of wall, so you get your wall here, and then you've got these very strong views out through these sort of noses to the broader landscape. So again, you're in, you're in the museum, you're lost in museum land, and then you can connect yourself back to where you actually are in your geographic location through those windows. So I won't dwell on these, but just on the, suffice to say, on the ground floor, um, it was about program like the cafe, the Shepherdens Visitor Centre, the Gallery Kaela, um, and uh, which were elements that could be used outside of office hours, but also some little workshops, community workshops as well, so that the museum became something that could be used beyond official museum purposes and also a catalyst or a business incubator as well. So just how the, um, it was broken up with those public activities on the ground, the museum proper on the first floor and on the rooftop, um, a, a garden and, and bar. So there's that idea of the, uh, the noses that you look through and out to the bigger landscape. And then here, this idea that the museum is incidental to your everyday activities. So, for instance, I'll just go back to here. If you're going for a walk or you're, you're taking your dog for a walk or you're going for a run, you can actually run through the museum. So it's, it has an openness and a generosity rather than just being a big lump in the middle of the park. And then that last image is, of course, what happens when it floods, um, sort of float away with your artworks, but that it would still work because it's this landscape of peaks and troughs and so it makes sense of being part of a bigger wetland. But alas... Not to be. <laughs> so, um, so this next project is the Arthur Boyd Creative Learning Centre uh, Gallery and Accommodation. And this is in Shoalhaven, so up in part of the Bundan on Trust in New South Wales. Uh, it's, uh, this came about Arthur Boyd and Yvonne Boyd. They left their property, their two properties, Riversdale and Bundan on, to the Australian people. I think Paul Keating uh, did that deal with Arthur. And it's the purpose of it was to leave this as a place for the appreciation of art and environment. And what's really um, beautiful about this project, in pati or particularly compelling for us, is that, and this painting here is of the site, it's a place where Arthur's works will be exhibited. So you'll be viewing the works in the actual place in which they were created. So it's this beautiful uh, opportunity to compare or think about this imaginary landscape of Boyd's and the actual landscape that you're within. So, our, um, so some, of the, some of the works by Arthur did inform how we approached the architecture for this. And one of the things this Another, photo, another painting of his from Shoalhaven, which is a really lovely example of this um, tension between an exotic landscape, which of course is represented by the rose, and then the indigenous um, landscape. So, and I think for someone like Arthur and apparently a lot of artists who went to this area to paint, especially those who'd come from, say, England or from Europe. They were just absolutely blown away by the Shoalhaven landscape. It's very particular qualities, sort of primordial qualities to it. So that sort of wrestling with that through European eyes, very interesting. And so what that means too is that the actual site itself, here's the Shoalhaven River, um, and the site we're working on is here between these two clearings. So what you have is also this tension between the bush 
and then these remnant clearings from its agricultural use, and used as farmland as well. So, um, also with a lot of his paintings from Shoalhaven, you get this very particular uh, organisation into the three parts, the sky, the earth or ground, and then the water. So there was something in that that we thought would be useful for our proportions and driving how we might frame things. So suffice to say, it's a site with enormous cultural, ecological, and also architectural significance. It has this building by um, Glenn Merkett, Wendy Lewin, and Reg Lark, the Yvonne and Arthur Boyd Education Centre. So quite a lot of pressure on this, um, on this site to you know, not muck it up, basically, um, which is often, it's often the task, is you, know, you get these extraordinary sites or amazing buildings that are already there, so how not to um, undermine them, make them better. So some of the thinking behind the project, one of the people we worked with um, was uh, Craig Burton, who had, I think, done some work with Glenn on the site as well, and um, Wendy and Reg. And he had these lovely drawings, which just show you even how this is a constantly evolving landscape, where these, this is uh, pre-73, um, where you can see the clearings and then how they're slowly getting smaller as the kind of bush comes further and further in. So it's quite fascinating. And then these little buildings here, which are the, his, the sort of historic cluster, they're not so much for their architectural values. They're actually reproduction buildings. They look older. But I think Arthur um, drew these up with another architect, or and I think a couple were even brought in on wheels, so to speak. So in and of themselves, they're not valuable, but they are culturally significant as where the family lived and where Arthur also painted in one of the studios. The other thing that was very important to understand was how the landscape worked, um, and especially as this sort of very undulating hilly landscape with rocky outcrops that you get these sort of dry gullies and wet gullies and so understanding its ecology. So we started to think about the architecture as a way to amplify some of those qualities and uh, characters of the site and, um, and particularly the Shoalhaven landscape. And we were interested in how you might provide a building that would give you a whole range of different experiences. So part of it you might be buried in the landscape Another part, you might actually be bridging over one of these famous Shoalhaven gullies. At other times, you might be sitting on top and sometimes projecting. So a very sort of simple diagram of the range of qualities. And one of the things we looked to for this idea, especially of bridging, were the flood, the flood, the trestle bridges that you get all through Australia in our flood landscapes. And the reason they seemed pertinent is because this is one of those sites that is also very prone to flooding. In fact, a lot of Arthur's paintings describe finding creatures, dead animals and things after the floods and sort of almost biblical notion of floods and things. So the flood as a motive is, is a big one in that landscape. And this is where we thought these, um, also because the building was, is quite large, and we thought, instead of trying to make a big building sort of smaller, let's treat it as a piece of infrastructure almost, like a flood bridge. So the other thing too is that this gives you this fantastic datum against the, the gully. So it's a way to really amplify the, the undulations in that landscape. So the initial site plan, here's the Merkit Lewin Light building here, the smaller Boyd cluster of buildings, and then what we call the bridge as our accommodation and visit, visitor facilities element, which goes over this gully. And buried in this hill is the gallery. So a model which just describes all those elements together. And so there we go. You can see that sort of undulation um, that is marked by, by the bridge. Uh, and interestingly, how that ties into how we thought about the environmental um, performance of the building is if you think about the sort of climate control you need in a gallery, obviously it's a very high standard, especially if you want to borrow works from elsewhere, so it has to be very heavily climatically controlled. Whereas there might be other parts of um, the buildings that could be much more in the spirit of plein air. Again, going back to Arthur, he liked to paint 
outside in, in the landscape, fully exposed to the elements. So what we're also interested in offering visitors is that range from a more cl controlled climate to one that you're much more exposed to. And so we have, um, that's uh, from our environmental engineer, just mapping out those different conditions. So here's the view of the, um, the bridge. And here is this sort of restored gully landscape. At the moment, everything is kind of mown and you don't really have a sense of the ecology of the site. So a big part of this, and this is work we did with Megan Raitt, uh, who's a New Zealand landscape architect, actually. Um, so we've worked on a broader landscape master plan, including the restoration of the, the gully. And then this idea of when you arrive, so for the bus drop off for kids, the bridge forms a big veranda where people can gather themselves, get their bags together, be in the shade and start to look towards the river and of course Arthur's famous hill just there. Then looking back um, towards the bridge, some of the terraces that are um, formed up as this part of this arrival uh, for outdoor activities. Bundan on Trust, its main purpose is two parts to it, a very large artist in residence program which mainly happens on the other site and then this one is more dedicated to children, school children, coming to do um, art programs for a few days, hence the accommodation parts. So this is where you see the bridge uh, linking into the subterranean gallery. And one of the great things, oh, this, oh, I'll come back to that in a sec. So um, these are some of the indoor outdoor learning areas too, these sort of uh, lovely veranda spaces between the accommodation rooms where you can have a group doing different activities. Again, always using the building to frame that beautiful landscape. And then finally in the gallery itself, uh, this moment where you might get a glimpse of the landscape outside and then the work that you're looking at which has come from that place. But of course, being subterranean, it has the benefit of having thermal stability and so it also makes the servicing of the project much easier. So, um, two more things to take you through. This one is the Botanical Gardens and uh, it's some work we've been doing with the gardens over the last year to try to, in very simple terms, to try and make it as part of it the gardens being nature and science precinct. So as Melbourne has its sports precinct, it has its arts precinct, there's this idea of the gardens being uh, central to a nature and science precinct. And one of the key projects within that is for the herbarium to you know, be opened up to the public and for more of its hidden assets to be revealed. So this is a project about making the invisible more visible. And it has a huge collection. Um, I think it's you know, valued at something like 250 million, this collection, which includes seeds and bits of plants from banks, Darwin even, Leichhardt, Birkenwells, like a phenomenal collection. And all of this is tucked away, not particularly well stored. So the works here is to do a subterranean uh, vault as well and then have other public programs to really um, enable more people to enjoy it. So going back to this idea too of museum as placemaker, what we could also see was how the, um, the building on the edge of the gardens and the, in the adjacent to the domain can actually um, interact with that so more people might just come and enjoy it day to day as well, uh, apart from formal visitors to the um, to the herbarium proper. So it's also, the project has been about putting the herbarium at the centre of visitor experience to the gardens. At the moment, a lot of people go to Observatory Gate as their starting point, which is more uh, aligned with um, astronomy. And uh, that's obviously important as part of the Nature and Science Precinct, but this project, its purpose is to try and put botany and um, the herbarium back in the centre. So a little sketch where we um, were thinking about how to, um, how to relate what happens underground with the sky. And really it's a way to, we started to think about a sort of underworld and a sky world. 
and um, the ground being the garden that you walk through to move between those two conditions, which was a nice way to tie botany back to astronomy on the other part of the site. So I won't labour on these. Suffice to say that a large part of the project is underground and what that means is that the garden can continue to be the main event on the ground level. You're not bogging up all of that area around the herbarium with a whole lot of buildings. You've actually put it underground, the garden continues over the top and then using more of the herbarium. So here's a little view. So this is actually uh, what is Dallas Brooks Drive at the moment. So that's becoming part of the forecourt into it, to a large canopy and within that a series of sort of circles, almost like some of the circular garden beds that are there now where a very sort of big ramp that people could come to with their plant samples. Uh, so one of the programs they run is you can bring in something to identify. So you'd come down, meet the botanists. So it's about um, some of the back of house becoming front of house. And similarly at night time, uh, looking down into this sort of underworld and then of course up to the sky uh, and constellations with that. So, um, last of all, I'm going to finish off with the stables, which is not technically a museum, but it is a project that is about the flourishing of the arts, certainly the making of the arts, and I thought it was a, probably a nice one to end on because it's also been <coughs> a big part of um, enhancing the South Bank campus of the University of Melbourne. So many of you may have noticed this building opposite Acker. It's hard not to notice. It's a very long building. In fact, I think we specialise in really long buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so we've measured the wing of the stables against the Bundanon one as our um, reference point of how long things were getting. Anyway, this was the <coughs> former mounted police stables. And, <coughs> excuse me, so there we go, another long building. Uh, this wing here was the actual stables. Then there's that lovely octagon on the corner, which was kind of an entry point into the large courtyard. Uh, and then the blue bit was the former riding school. This is the Grant Street Theatre, which was connected but not part of our project. So this was the stables wing uh, when, when it was uh, early days of being used with the horses, the hay up the top in this mezzanine, this beautiful light and of course all of the cubicles and the horse, um, horse stalls. The horses on parade in the, in the courtyard, so the whole site has this police uh, history. Then more recently the horses in the riding school and I think by the time the building got handed over there'd only been about nine horses there for some, for some time. So this is what we uh, were presented with. And I must say it's another one of those projects where the starting point, the building is just so beautiful, whether it's um, with the previous project with the Boyd one, the landscape's the thing. Here the, the building was extraordinary. And you know, there's part of you that thinks just don't <coughs> touch it. It's magnificent as it is. So again, how not to muck it up. So this was um, what it became, and I'll talk through more of that in a minute. And then similarly, the writing school, uh, which became a performing arts um, space. So, and the octagon, uh, events space, studio space down the bottom, and then a sort of fantastic meeting room up the top underneath this lovely lantern, which when the police had been there, um, poor police and aesthetics, it's not a strong, <laughs> strong connection. They'd put false ceilings and things through there, so you just didn't have any, um, any sense of this amazing structure underneath. So, uh, the thing about this project was it's a, real, it's a real case of finding a really good fit between new uses and existing forms that you find. And it's also a case in point of just how much we can do with our existing heritage. So. It was a very smart thing to think, yep, these cubicles make good sense for um, art studios. You know, they're already divided into a whole lot of things. And then this is a big clear space, makes perfect sense for a performing arts space. And then, of course, the distinctiveness of the octagon, a very handsome front of house. And the fit was one horse got us two students per, per horse stall. So it was a really, um, a sort of, really easy way to, to fit. Uh, you know, a lot of the hard work had been done. 
And um, it was very, very smart, I think, who, who it was who identified this building as the place for uh, VCA School of Art. So to do this work, it did involve the whole range or a spectrum of interventions from uh, restoration of the most significant parts of the heritage fabric. It was a building with a very high uh, um, registration of significance. And then it also meant sometimes having to cut or remove and in this instance to create these doors onto Dodd Street and also to add things as well. So, so just very quickly, this was the original that we started with and you can see these very big voids that's part of that. So then what we did, we decided this part had the most intact uh, horse stalls and architectural details, whereas there'd been interventions in lots of the wings before. So this bit we called the heritage slice, and it's where we decided to restore as much as possible um, so you could really understand the original fabric in that section of the building. And that's what you see here. It's where we reinstated all of the flooring. This continues all the way underneath the timber floor. It's just that for this to be usable for art students and to have trolleys going up and down and to make it level, horses are happy on an angle, students weren't, nor were staff. So there's an enormous amount of work in a project like this you never actually see, it's just behind. And the other idea with these sorts of projects is that everything is reversible. So the works we've done could be taken away and you could go back to the original fabric. So, so what we ended up with was in this heritage area is where we kept the largest of the voids and this is where the staff offices are and the main stair linking the top and bottom floors. Um, so there's some staff in their offices. One of the things you might remember in that early shot of the, when it was the horses, the cages on the side and Heritage Victoria really wanted us to keep those um, because it was original part of the fabric. And the staff were just like, we, look, we can cope with the Mr. Ed door having to stay, <laughs> but we just really can't abide those metal cages. So fair enough, they, um, they were not pursued. Similar, again, little details under each of the horse stalls, these beautiful uh, um, brick pavers, which all had to be leveled, reinstated, and then put back and then a covering over the top. So again, you don't see these except for a couple of spots, but they're all there. So, and you can see the builders have numbered all of these. So just enormous amount of effort in that. Then this whole thing, the blue bits are where we cut or took away. Again, with heritage work, sometimes it's about what you take away rather than what you add that's the most important thing you can do. So the cuts I've talked about for the entries, and then the revealing of this beautiful existing structure that was there. And what we did, this is on the top floor, this is what was almost like the Knights of the Round Table um, table here. We put an oculus in this section, which from underneath you can look up to, from the entry up to that beautiful uh, skylight. So then was what we added. Now this is sort of where it got more contentious because we needed more floor area than there already was. And so what we decided to do was actually fill in some of the voids, not all of them, um, to create additional studios up the top. What was good about doing that was that even though it seemed counterintuitive to fill in some of the void mm -hmm. is because under the void you got the beautiful clerestory light, for, perfect for painting and drawing. And we also had very, these mezzanine ceiling heights were very low. They didn't comply anymore. So we thought, why don't we just put our walking circulation to this edge, which had just enough clearance. And instead of putting the studios in that under the heat of the roof, this just made much more sense to put them in that. So some little diagrams around that. I won't labour these. So just to take you for a walk through how it's working now, um, here you can see to clear that head height, we peeled the floor up to stop people hitting their heads on this and turned this into a folio bench. And now you can just see how students are occupying it. So it's, um, oh, okay, I'll come back to that. The other thing with a building like this is what you do with all your servicing, how you accommodate all your um, heating and cooling and air ventilation systems without uh, impacting too much on the heritage fabric. So what we decided is instead of trying to get all of that inside the building, we would actually 
use, put it outside in these three sort of new urban blocks, we called them. So what that did, it took the pressure off the interiors and it also meant that we could use these elements to start to be the beginning of forming up the placemaking of that courtyard, which only has a temporary landscape at the moment, um, but in time, I think that's, they're going to do that next year to re-landscape all of this. But we use these elements to start to sort of set up areas within that area. So this is our lift. Imagine if we tried to put that in there. So by pulling it out and connecting it with a breezeway helped. This block services the Performing Arts Centre and here we lifted it off the ground. So that's created a little cafe barbecue space underneath. So it's using something like services to actually have some sort of civic impact, if you like. There you can see there's the canopy which um, protects people waiting to go into the Performing Arts Centre. And there. Um, one other thing that's important about this project is how, this is particularly with education work we're finding, how easily the spaces can adapt to do very different things. So the school works as day-to-day -day has to work as studio spaces, it's where art is being made. And then very regularly though, they have exhibitions. And in the past, they'd had to have, um, you know, constantly schlep walls from a shed down the back and all these oh and issues of people moving temporary walls and they're not very stable and so on. So we actually played with the geometry of the building to have sliding walls and these pieces of the pie that could arrange the spaces in very different ways. So here we have Ben from the office in action moving those walls around and the different sort of uses. Sometimes they're like a little seminar or a crit session where people stand around and other times it's used as gallery space or events or you can have more bays open and make it like a little lecture theatre. Similarly in the art studios as well, lots of moving panels so you can change the way in which things are exhibited or the how many bigger spaces, smaller spaces for exhibition. So again, here's our new walls that went over the top of the original horse stalls. So you can, you can still see the original fabric with these new white walls there. Now something people often ask me is, um, how did you get to paint it white with heritage? And the school was really keen for it to be white. And at one stage we thought um, we'd have to leave it this sort of yellowier colour that it was when we um, started on the building. Turns out through paint scrapings that originally it was like a white lime wash. So everybody was happy. <laughs> but here you can see this is day to day where people are in their studios and then sort of spilling out into these areas more for their um, sort of review times. And I've seen classes happening around here. So this is what people start with. They just get their white space, neat little bit of furniture. And then this fantastic explosion of activity and creative endeavour, that means each of those just tells you so much about the person working in there, their approach to practice. So it's a really beautiful index of all the different ways people use and take over space. And I sort of, I find it fascinating how some people put these barriers up and mm -hmm. other people are really happy to be open. Some are messy, some are neat. It's, um, it's really, really interesting study. So similarly upstairs, these are the upstairs ones underneath the claristry, that's what they start with. And then again a survey of the different um, ways in which they've been used is fascinating. So just a final little walk around. I love from the body language, you know, you sort of know what this person is probably going through from that, <laughs> that posture. And then it's also nice how people walking past can sort of glance in. So it's always working as a, as a, um, as a gallery of sorts. Um, just doing what you do in art school. <laughs> uh, so all of the different practices. And it seems to work, you know, whether you're painting or making installations or whatever. So these later, later images are of the final exhibition at the end of the year, which I think Charles was saying you'd been to, um, and seeing those horse stables use that. And for the final show, uh, how it is in exhibition mode. So it's really amazing to see it from this um, cacophony of things most of the time, and then it all gets cleaned up and the exhibition happens. These are works by Maximilian Harley, I think is his name. 
So there it is for exhibition mode with these walls um, in the centre as opposed to on the side. And to finish, um, here's just, I love the posture of these people. Someone who teaches quite a lot, you just have, again, have a really strong sense of the sort of conversation that's happening there, this kind of contemplation. So that's it for me. I just wanted to finish by um, just reiterating how all of these projects obviously deal with the purpose of um, holding spaces for the making of art, but also they're sort of repositories of sorts, but also that they give something back to their bigger landscape, whether it's a campus or a beautiful rural scape or uh, in urban streetscape. So thank you.